side. We can sit wherever you want. Here's a beer at your feet. This is my better side. That's, that's not a good look. <laughs> Just button it all the way up to the top. Pete, that is in these days. I don't like that look. Is that in these days? Oh yeah, people are all about the top button. I don't know what's in these days. Welcome everyone to our first featured artist video here on the Art History Babes YouTube channel. If you just stumbled upon this video and you're unfamiliar with who we are, Art History Babes podcast will be linked down below for you. Be sure to check that out. Uh, head over to our website, arthistorybabes.com. Today, I will be talking to our new featured artist, Zach Clark. Cool. He is here to talk to us about his art, about his experience as an artist and as an MFA. We're going to head into the studio, check out some stuff, probably reminisce a little bit about our time in grad school together. We know each other from grad school. Zach has actually been on a few episodes of the podcast. We'll link all of his episodes down below for you. Um, you were on Karita Kent, Albert Durer, and most recently our uh, Rauschenberg episode, which was kind of a drunken mess, but we'll see how that turns out. You know what? I've got a good, I've got a good faith. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. There were some golden moments for <laughs> sure. And we have a special guest today. Zach Clark. Zach Clark, Mr. Zach Clark. Back. And he is nerd history. Babe. We're not talking about Catholics this time. We did talk about hella Catholics oh, last time. Oh, we got real church. You know what? Time. We did, but I really loved it. I thought it was great. But I really like what you said about Rauschenberg kind of being a nouveau dada. Because there are a lot of these ready-made things that happen with his combines. Like yeah. Like with the goat combine. I've seen that piece multiple times and it still yeah, that's hits a big me one. Zach, inside in, in a your way heart. that um, like, right in your heart. not a lot of other stuff does. Yeah. 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 Zach. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to our YouTube channel. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name is Zach Clark. I am a printmaker, edition maker... Um, publisher based in Oakland, California. I also work under the name National Monument Press, where I work on projects that are specifically concerned with um, uniquely American experiences and ideas. Not to like nerd out too much, the, the National Monument System is different from the National Park System in that the National Monument System was created specifically to maintain Native American sites. And, oh. and so National Monuments are declared purely by presidential proclamation and are usually based out of a conservation and educational purpose as opposed to the national parks are declared by Congress and are for um, the entertainment and beauty um, for Americans. I learned something today. I am really interested in ideas of locational memory. There is a familial uh, like the line that ties a lot of the work that I have been making for the last few years, largely because of lots of people dying. And so that has sort of caused um, a deeper investigation into some of those things. I also travel a lot and always have my whole life. And so the sort of relationship to place and people and memories um, is something that I'm just always really interested in. Some of the larger publishing projects I'm doing are really interested in collaboration and America in a broad sense of, you know, our protected lands, our politics, or just, you know, some of the projects I'm working on that are about like pop culture. You said memory has always been a important theme in your work. Does this like stretch back to early years, like undergrad? Like when did you start really working with photography and, and captured moments? So that's actually funny because photography is how I found out about art. I signed up for an architecture class when I was a freshman in high school. and <laughs> I'm just imagining you like shooting pictures and someone's like, hey, have you heard about this art thing? My grandpa, who I never remember taking any photos mm -hmm. ever, gave me a camera when I was 14, I guess. And then I signed up for an architecture class, these are two completely independent things. And the guy who taught our architecture classes, he was actually a photographer, but they didn't have anyone teach architecture. And then that next year, the woman who ran the art department at our high school, she retired. And so they let him take the photography classes. And he convinced all these like punk rock kids that were in his architecture class <laughs> to take photography. And then what was like one class that barely ran, he ended up running seven sessions of a day 
because he just got this the school that I went to so excited about photography. Why were all the punk rock kids in architecture? Is I don't there like a connection know. there? <laughs> when I went to undergrad, photography was actually my focus. And but I went to a school that was really small and you just kind of took whatever was offered and I took every class that was offered in the first two years there and then I dropped out and joined a band. And then like when I finally went back to finish my undergrad six years later I was over photography and just like went back to school and didn't know what I was going to do I knew I was an art major I had a friend Adam Grossi who was the grad student who taught my class that was like you should be a painter and I was like okay yeah I'll be a painter <laughs> even though I'd never painted before when I spent the summer in Europe um I needed a way to keep making and I don't I'm not a big drawer. Mm -hmm. um, and so I brought my Holga, which is like, for those of you who don't know, a really like crappy plastic medium format camera. And it shoots film. And I just shot almost 40 rolls of film over a couple of months. Wow. Um, and then realized that actually my Holga captured images the way that I want to. And so then I kind of made this hard shift from geometric abstraction into like photographic based work. Although I still don't know if I'd call myself a photographer. Even though I feel like that's been the only, like, common thread yeah, during your entire process. I think I'm a bad photographer. <laughs> just take blurry photos. I guess a lot of your work is blurry, but yeah. that's, I mean... In fact, I had critiques where they were like, how do we know you just don't know what you're doing? <laughs> You know, when I was finishing my BFA, since I went and got my BFA later, I mean, I was 25, I really approached my BFA kind of like it was grad school because I'd already been out working and I'd already like lived a couple of lives yeah. and I really realized that's what I wanted to do. So I had always had the idea that I knew I wanted to go to grad school eventually. And then when we moved from Chicago to out here, I was an academic advisor at California College of the Arts for several years and really realized how much I loved academia which is funny is like somebody who was a dropout to them like love <laughs> academia but also like it was really great to exist in that staff model but or that staff role but realizing I really like needed to be back into making art I was starting to show a good amount and I was happy with what I was making and um decided like you know it's time to push it to the next level and go to grad school I now know that like when you're doing okay is actually not the time to go to grad school. Like, you should go to grad school when you're in crisis mode. Or you're ready that's, to completely stop doing what you're doing. That's uh, pretty good advice. You should go to grad school when your life is falling apart. Yeah, because if, if not, you're just going to go into an emotional free fall anyways. What's your favorite grad school memory? Oh, gosh. That's tough. Because actually, grad school's great. I loved it. I, it was... The best two years and the worst two years of my life. Yeah. More on the best side, though. It was great. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's, a, it's an intense yeah. experience both ways. <laughs> um, we went to a school that was really tight-knit, and the um, the MFA program at Davis all is in one building that, like, I remember a faculty member one time being like, yeah, you and your clubhouse, and I was like, hey, <laughs> those are studios. We're working. And then being like, yeah, I guess it kind of is. It was like, a clubhouse. We had a lot of really good parties. <laughs> um... <laughs> Actually, okay, if, uh, so I'd have to say probably the best memory, the best, like, moment that I will probably think about forever is these happened on the same night. So there was a night we had open studios when Peter Sheldahl was in town. Oh, yeah, I loved him. Peter Sheldahl, who is um, the critic for um, The New Yorker, is it? I always mess it up. It's I don't, The New Yorker. Is it The New Yorker? It's a very important magazine in New York. Peter Sheldahl, very respected art critic and also one of the coolest human beings yeah. i've ever met in my life like he is so dope during the open studio it was when like it really kind of was a party i walked into my studio at one point and he was in there by himself reading all of the like writing on my walls and he just goes you should be a writer you need to take the time to write every day you're a good writer and then just walked out of my studio uh, that's it's the kind of thing where it's like oh well when, if peter sheldahl tells you that then yeah. that's pretty cool <laughs> And then a couple hours later, after we'd had a few more drinks, I walked back into my studio and Wayne was in there, Tebow. Oh, geez. And so I have this really um, silly photo of Man, that Wayne. Man, that was an all-star night. Uh, it was a pretty, <laughs> yeah. So I have this picture of me and Wayne in front of my wall in my studio. Uh, that, that's a, that's that's a stellar a pretty, night. Yeah. That's a banger night yeah. right there.
I would definitely call myself a printmaker. Printmaking. Um, although I might also argue, like, I now have kind of shifted where I thought that photography wasn't art, it was only photography. <laughs> I now kind of think as photography is printmaking. It is, I guess. You're making, you know, it's, you're making it's, it's, prints, it's an online yeah. multiple. Yeah. Um, and you're, so you're printing images. Yeah. Yeah. You know, photo emulsion, like that process is not that much different than like etching plates in copper, mm -hmm. you know, but I really love just the multiplicity, the democraticness of printmaking, the, you know, the punk rockness of it. Like I'll never shake that. You even gave me the heads up on that one, and I. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> like, oh man, I'm like getting emotional. <laughs> um, I always say that I wish I could have met Susan O'Malley, um, who is from Oakland. Like, I have we have lots of, like, I'm in a similar circle as her, but she unexpectedly passed away four or five years ago. For folks that don't know, she makes these really big like poster installation type works that are all like really kind of just like positive statements. Like, I love her work so much and um, I wish I could have met her. <laughs> Bigger name point of view, I'd probably still say Albert Durer. Oh yeah. Mainly because now... I wonder what he'd be like. I feel like we don't know enough about him to really get a sense of what his personality was like and on the albert durer episode when we when i accidentally talked myself into thinking that he may have been the thomas kincaid of the 15th century <laughs> um i started to get really nervous you recently did an exhibition called great hope it yeah. was a collaborative um, print exchange. Actually, if you watched our uh, Art History Babe Work Weekend vlog, we were looking through some of the prints from that, so if you haven't, go check that out. But tell us a little bit more about that. So Great Hope was a project that I came up with sort of in response to just being exhausted by um, the outrage of our current political <laughs> climate, and really wanted to make a body of work that was um, more generative and more, I don't know if optimistic is the word that I want to use, but also still had some hopeful. Like, <laughs> it was still in reference to like, you know, what is giving you hope within our current difficult times. Also isn't a polarizing question because even like people who are on a different political end of the spectrum as me, there's still hardships going on in the world for them yeah. as well. Uh, it, it all kind of came together with this gallery at UMass Amherst that asked me to do this show. And I had started to get this idea of wanting it to be also like me making the work, but since I'm just one person with one point of view, like have a multiplicity of voices. And then so turned it into kind of having an open call, um, which some of you probably heard about on the podcast, that then really kind of spiraled out of control. What I thought was going to be maybe 15 or 20 of my friends that wanted to also have work in the show ended up being over 70 artists and there were over a hundred prints. And, um, it was awesome. Um, <laughs> every single piece was incredible. And even pieces that like, were like, eh, like, I'm not crazy about this. I would then go to the show and everybody loved. Um, and so like, there was something for everybody in a really exciting way. Also just the experience at UMass, how students who were in the gallery responded to it, how faculty responded to it, how just the conversations that it ended up bringing up were really kind of incredible. And then a lot of the other people who came along with the show, like all these women that were from Monterey, that there were almost 20 of them that all like made work together that were so inspired by the just call to be hopeful. And, and it was, yeah, the most rejuvenating art experience I've had in a while. The show is gonna travel to Arizona, um, to Tucson in August, and there's gonna be some new work made for that. And then we're talking about having it shown in Monterey um, sometime in the fall. It's very exciting. And Zach, made like a art history babes print so we got to be a part of it it was really nice it's pretty cute it is really cute yeah. i'm still working on figuring out what the next few stages of great hope is and like what a show on a body that continues to grow and move is i'm working on doing more publishing with some other folks past featured artist faith sponsler and i are working on a book together kind of the two like bigger things i'm working on right now are this book of photos from japan that is going to be a collaboration with 
our friend in Japan who is a collage artist for the art history bay is working on this collection of prints that are based on photos that I took on a camping trip last summer that um, I just reshot the same roll of film um, I think three times over two days and then forgot about the roll of film until about a month ago and, and they're these really interesting images that are part like carrying a pizza float to the river but also these like kind of really dark ominous images that are kind of happens when you're walking in redwood groves and also sitting at a river and when those images come together let's go look at what you're working on let's head into the studio great Serious hardware. Right. So what's happening is um, Oh no. There's something about the idea of like getting this block of text that somebody else had set and then passed away and it was still together and like printing that again. That's just a really um, powerful and like interesting activity. eventful studio visit. <laughs> yep. Technology was not on our side. The Rizzo gods won this this battle. Yeah, and I feel like that's so stereotypical. Like printers never work, you know. Yeah. I'm sorry that you have to deal with that so regularly. Okay. <laughs> Zach is working on a collaboration with us. He is currently working on some prints that are going to be for sale through our website for a limited time only. Uh, we will actually wrap up this video with some images of them once they're finished. So you'll get to see them and there'll be links for you if you're interested in purchasing them. We will also have all of Zach's information linked below. Where can they find you, Zach? Uh, NationalMonumentPress.com or ZachClarkIs.com or at Zach Clark is on almost every social media. There you go. Give us a like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, also, links to all of the podcast stuff will be down below for you. Uh, thanks for watching our first featured artist video. Thanks, guys. I hope you had fun. I did. Make sure to let us know what kind of content you'd like to see on our channel. Uh, throw it in the comments. You can email us at arthistorybabes at gmail.com. We got a lot of other videos up for you to check out. Um, but yeah, that's it, and we'll see you later, guys. Bye! When we first started talking about me being a featured artist, um, we talked about a podcast that I could come back on that might relate to something that I was going to make as work. And I immediately thought of Robert Rauschenberg and how important he was to me as an artist when I was first starting. He had a retrospective that was here at the SF MoMA um, a few months back, and going through that, I saw his a lot of his later work after he had moved to Florida and really started traveling a whole lot more that really resonated with me in a new way. Um, and especially how important travel was for his work and also just being out by the ocean and out of the city. And at the same time, I had gotten a roll of film back that I had shot the previous summer that I had completely forgotten about. That hell, that I had just reshot. Um, you know, two or three times having double and triple exposures. But from a camping trip up north near the Redwoods, as soon as I got the photos back, I started sending around to the friends that I had thought were on the trip. And um, it turned out that one friend that I insisted was there, as soon as I started to send them out, realized that that was impossible. She was on the other side of the country dealing with some health, shit, health issues. And I became really interested in how, um, you know, my brain had created this memory. and. Um, with a lot of my work having to do with memory in the first place, that sort of fallacy that had happened was really interesting. And aesthetically, they, because of the triple exposure, they 
had a sort of visual collage characteristic that was really similar to Rauschenberg's screen prints and then some of these digital collages he was doing right at the end of his career. And so for my featured prints, I have made um, three different risograph prints that then come in an envelope that has also been printed, sort of to mimic the, um, the feeling that when we used to go get rolls of film printed, it would come back in this envelope and you'd be able to, to kind of relive the memory as you're looking through the photos. Um, except with these photos that I've selected, they really live in this tension space um, of, you know, they're being in the redwoods there. They're obviously, there's a beauty to them, but all three that I've selected have a certain eeriness to them that I think has an interesting relationship to that idea of your brain playing tricks on you. I hope you like them, uh, and thanks.